What is up, Reactathon? My name is Ken C. Dodds, and I'm so excited to be talking with you virtually in this remote conference. And I want to talk with you about managing state management, specifically for React. So my main assertion here is that React is a state management library, and I am going to kind of try and prove that thesis to you through the course of our, our conversation here. Um, but first, I wanted to just show you a couple of things about me. I'm not going to belabor this at all. You can find these slides right here um, on my GitHub, Managing State Management Slides. Uh, the one thing that I do want to call out specifically, though, is Epic React, which you can find at epicreact.dev. This is everything that I know about React put into one place, made really accessible for all of you. So please do take a look at Epic React. It is an enormous amount of material um, and just great learning. I've, I've poured a silly amount of time into this and uh, people seem to really, really like it. So if you haven't heard of it yet, go definitely take a look. So uh, let's start out with a couple of expectations. First of all, this talk is uh, all about how state management, uh, application state management, doesn't have to be as difficult as we sometimes make it. And that's normally driven by the way that we're thinking about state management. So that can make a major impact on the maintenance of your application. And uh, yeah, again, my assertion that React may be all that you need for your UI state. Um, this talk is not dogmatic, though. I realize that my problems are not your problems, but hopefully there's enough of an overlap there where we can come to an agreement on uh, different ways to simplify the performance and maintenance of our React applications. Uh, and then here's some just questions that people always ask me. And one thing I want to point out, Night Owl, that's uh, the shirt I'm wearing right now. So I've got a shirt for my theme uh, for VS Code. It's pretty legit. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so let's talk about state management. Really, it is a hard problem. Let's, let's think about state just in general. What is state? So state is basically data that changes over time. So it's information. Information is data. It changes over time. And anytime you add uh, time, <laughs> anytime you add time to uh, anything that just complicates the the whole problem. So if if all we had to do was um, have some like consistent data, it just never changed, and just show that to the user, that would make everything easy. We wouldn't need React. We'd just need a uh, some sort of server template thing, and and then you render it and stick it on a CDN or something. But no, the, our our applications are interactive and they change, and and we've got. Uh, you know, things on the server that change, we need to make our applications react to those changes. All of that is what makes state management kind of a difficult problem. But because it's such a difficult problem, I think that it's sometimes we over engineer it, uh, assuming that maybe something could come up that um, would necessitate a really um, flexible solution. And that ends up over engineering our uh, solution in general, um, which leads to uh, code bases that are harder to maintain than they should be. So let's talk about a couple of the different um, uh, ways that we can simplify our state management. The first thing is, and I think this is the most important, this is the part that like unlocks everything for us, uh, is the way that we think about state. So there are actually two categories of state that I like to think of. There are many categories, but pretty much all of these can kind of fit into two buckets, either your server cache or your UI state. So uh, these two things aren't the same thing and treating them the same is actually my big state management mistake, which you can read um, at uh, in the Epic React Dev articles there. So uh, the server cache is state. It is data that changes over time, but it's actually stored persisted on the server, and then we um, cache it in the client for quick access. Uh, and the reason that we do this is uh, for performance reasons. So uh, if I were Netflix, for example, and every single time I navigate to your movies page or what, whatever, and uh, like every time every user went to um, the you know information about a particular um, seasonal episode, uh, episodic um, you know, TV show like uh, Stranger Things or something. If um, I hit the database every single time, um, especially on a big release, that would probably tear the data database down. It wouldn't be really great. And so we add a layer of caching between us and the back end so that we uh, don't 
tear down the database. And we do the same thing for client side uh, stuff as well. So for like my own user data or whatever, just caching is basically an optimization to avoid uh, performance problems. And so we have this server cache uh, on the client side so that we don't have to make a request to the backend every single time we want to get some information. Um, and that may not just be because we don't want to hit the backend all the time. It could just be that we don't want to have the user having to wait on every single page transition to go get some data that they already have in their browser. And so we have that server cache where the, the state is actually stored on the back end. And then we have our UI state. And this is state that's stored on the front end, meaning that if you refresh the page, that state is totally gone. And there's lots of stuff like this, like the is open state, or if you're using enums like you should, then uh, a status uh, state for the modal, whether it's open or closed. Um, and like the the checkout flow state maybe you store some of that stuff on the back end but some of it you may not really care if the user hits refresh or or navigates away or something you don't really need to store all that so that's the difference is like where do you put this state if if it gets saved on the server then that's what what you've got is not ui state what you have is a server cache if it's stuff that's only maintained in the front end it's just client stuff then that's ui state and those two things need to be treated separately so when i'm talking about state and how react is all you really need for UI state. That's what I'm talking about is just the stuff that is managed on the front end. Now, of course you can use react for that server side stuff. And that's exactly what react query does. And this is what I recommend is you actually use react query um, for managing your server cache, because it gives you all the right knobs to turn and whatever to control how your server cache works. Uh, and you have all of those performance benefits of a cache. It does a really, really good job of this. Um, and then once you put all of your server cache stuff in a special place for the server cache, then all that's left is just so simple that there's no real reason to bring in other libraries with a couple of exceptions that we'll talk about. One other thing that I want to mention here is to just keep an, a close eye on Remix Run. If you haven't heard of it already, go take a look. Uh, it's from Ryan Florence and Michael Jackson, uh, creators of React Router. It is going to change the game um, in regard to server cache and UI state. It's very, very cool uh, stuff that they're doing over there. So keep an eye out for that. But for right now, React Query is just amazing. I'm a big fan. And uh, I should mention also that Remix Run doesn't necessarily mean that React Query is totally irrelevant. You can use them together. But uh, there are some really interesting things coming. Um, I'm really excited about Remix Run. OK, so separate your server cache, your UI state. And now let's talk about the UI state and what we can do to simplify that even further. So let's talk about how we think about our state. Let's imagine that we're building like a Twitter or something like that. Uh, and let's see what our component tree could look like. So we've got our app. We have a left nav with a bunch of links and a, a drop down and a button. We've got our main content that has our, all of our tweets and everything. And then our right controls for search and, and trends and all of that stuff. So a couple of questions here. What is global state in the context of this type of a, a structure here? Well, I think that, uh, you know, there, there's a couple elements of state. Um, there's the drop down, and that would have a maybe a state machine behind it that has the status of, or the, the current state of the drop down, whether it's open and closed and, and different things like that. Um, I, I wouldn't really put that into global state, but back in the day with uh, when I was all in on Redux and, and everything, I just because that existed, I just wanted to make it global. I just like, we, we had a place for state and that's just where we stick all of our state. And that was a big mistake. And it's not just Redux that, that enabled this. There's really any, like you could do this with context, uh, anything that enables that sort of attitude towards state, um, just driving everything to global uh, can lead to some serious performance or um, application maintenance problems and actually potentially performance problems as well. Uh, and so, yeah, the drop down that that state probably doesn't need to live at, at the app level. OK, that is UI state, uh, but it probably doesn't need to live at the app level. Um, but what about uh, like the, the user? maybe the, the current user. Uh, we're going to need the user for the timeline. We might even need the user inside of this dropdown to know which options to show. Uh, when we click on the tweet button, we may need the user so that we have the, the profile and the modal pop up properly, whatever. There's a, plenty of reasons that the user would need to be used uh, 
uh, by all of these components. So that's definitely something that would need to be global state. And we'll talk a little bit more about like, well, okay, so what about the tweets? Should that be like, that's server cache stuff, but like, where do we even um, treat that, um, some of that stuff as well? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the future too. Um, so yeah, and then let's talk about the, we'll, we'll talk about the prop drilling problem as well. Cause like if we just put everything global, then we just had to drill down forever. Um, uh, so we'll talk about that too. Um, and then another thing to think about with like where you put state and like how you think about state in your application is how well does that scale over time? Um, uh, so one thing that I found is that the more stuff you put in the global, um, like namespace or, or the global area of your application, the uh, more complex that area uh, area of your application gets. And um, when it's the global thing, that touches everything in your application. And so you don't want that to be complex. You want it to be as simple as possible. Uh, and so we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So let's let's kind of get into some of these things. So React is a state management library. It's the one you don't have to yarn at, npm install, bower install, unpackage, script tag, link, or any of that stuff. You already have it. And for the uninitiated, this is how you manage state with React. You have react.useState. You provide an initial value for that state. That gives you back an array from which we can destructure the count and the set count, so the state and a mechanism for updating that state. And then we can render whatever UI we want to based on that state. Anytime there's an update, React will trigger a re-render, meaning it will call this function again, and it will always give us back the most recent version of this count state. That's and, and that's it. Like that's all that you really need to know. I mean, we've got lazy initialization and we've got, you know, certain things like that. But like that conceptually that's all that you really need to know about React state management. And I think that is conceptually quite simple. And if we can um push more of our state into that frame of uh or or that sort of abstraction, we'll be better off. So uh, let's talk about like the common question that people uh, jump in here. It's like, well, okay, so Kent, that counter sure is nice. And I like the counter because I, I like that it, um, it it lets us focus on the API and, and not uh, get distracted by the extra stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, the next question is like, well, yeah, the, a counter is a counter, but um, what about more complex things? Like if I want to share state across components. So this is like tail as old as time. We've been doing this since the beginning with React and uh, to solve this problem. And we just lift state up. So uh, if we wanted to suddenly have this count display, uh, display the, the count from the counter, then the solution is to move this uh, state to the least common parent and then pass those values down. So our uh, count display can now take the, or here, we'll take our counter first. We'll just do like a refactor right here first. So we'll say our count, and um, let's have a on increment click. This will be increment. Okay, and then we'll accept those as props. So count and on increment click, and we'll put those right there. And now, with a, as far as the user's concerned, that was basically a refactor. There are some semantic differences with moving things around like this because now when the state updates, the whole app is going to re-render, but the user doesn't know anything about that. That's an implementation detail for them. Uh, that was, the, what we've done is essentially a refactor from their perspective. So now we want to add this new feature. Um, so we've got this count display thing. We want to display that actual count. And so now because our state is being stored in the least common parent, we can just simply pass that down. And we accept that. And we're done. Okay, it's pretty simple. Uh, we, we lift state up. This is like super duper common. Uh, and it's not really specific to React either. Like this is the sort of thing that you would do with functions. So you've got a function, it has some state in it. And then you have this other function you want to, like you've got this parent function, you're calling into that one. But now you need access to that in this other function that that parent calls. So you just move that value up to the parent uh, function and you pass it down to either. Um, so it's a pretty natural, normal JavaScripty thing that we do. Uh, but sometimes our designs change in the opposite way. So like maybe some, uh, the product manager comes around and says, hey, that count display, we don't need that anymore. And like now it's just gonna say, cool count, yo. And so that's that's the thing. And, and so you might just update it to be that and you're like, great, I'm done. It, it works and it technically does. Uh, 
But, uh, you know, it'd probably be a good idea to get rid of the props here, or at least that prop. Um, and then, um, and then, oh yeah, we're, we're passing that prop. So let's get rid of that. And this is about as far as we typically go. I, I don't, uh, it, it's not very natural for us to, to keep going from here because everything's working. And especially when you've got lots of components in here that may or may not be using this state. Uh, it's kind of like a, a CSS thing where you don't want, you want to touch as little as possible because you're worried you're going to break something. Uh, and so you just do as much as, or as little as you possibly can to get things working and then you move on to the next ticket. What I would challenge you to do is to co-locate the state. So once you've made this refactor, I want you to take a look at the state, the mechanism for updating that state, and see if it's being used by more than one component. In our case, it's not. It's only being used by a single component. So there's no reason for this app to maintain that state anymore. And we can actually move this right back to where we had it in the first place. We no longer need to accept those props. And now we can just pass this and we can get rid of those props. And this uh, is like a very simple thing. We just basically undid everything that we did, but um, it can have a drastic impact on your code base over time. Because if you think about this, eventually everything will end up in your app component. Like your app will just be managing all the state. And this is what happens pretty often. And we just end up uh, putting things in context. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And we just put it all at the global um, and that just makes the global more complicated. Uh, and you don't want that to be complicated. You want that to be simple. And so forcing things down the React component tree will have maintenance impacts, like a positive maintenance impact, as well as a performance impact, um, a positive one. So um, yeah, lift state up and then co-locate state. Um, React, this is just, this is a thing that we've been doing with React since the very dawn of React uh, years and years ago. So we just keep doing that. So let's talk about the prop drilling problem. As we lift state up, we've got to pass state down to the components that need it. Just in this simple example, we had to lift it up, but then we had to pass as props uh, to the counter and counter display. Um, but things can get pretty messy if you have multiple, like many layers of components and maybe you're passing things through components that don't even care about the state. It just happens that their children have to need to use that state or whatever. This can be kind of annoying, um, but the reason that I put this in quotes as a problem is because it's actually not necessarily a problem. I actually see it as kind of a, kind of a benefit uh, to React because uh, with other frameworks that I've used, things just were magically in the global namespace. And, and so you never knew who was using what and what, um, like why, what changed or whatever. Uh, with prop drilling, you can really easily follow the, like, and statically follow the code path. Unless you're doing something like, you know, props and, you know, more props and whatever, then then things get a little bit uh, confusing. So I don't typically recommend doing that except for, you know, components that are wrapping a button or something like that. Um, but in general, prompt drilling is not really a problem, but it can be an annoyance. And there are things that we can do before we uh, jump to libraries or even context, which we'll talk about in a second, um, which make it so we don't really need to do those things. So the first, your first line of defense against a prompt drilling problem is the use of composition. So uh, here's an example of the prompt drilling problem. We've got our header, we've got our left nav and you know your main content and everything. Uh, and if there's some state that needs to be shared between those. And so, uh, you know, and based on the children of these different components. And so we're gonna pass that state, we'll pass the mechanism for updating the state and then those will prompt drill it further. Uh, and this is a pretty natural way to write our components because we see things as kind of a black box and we're like, okay, so this box is in charge of this thing. And then this, and there's a smaller box inside of that box and whatever. But often these types of components are actually layout components. They're not really managing state themselves. They're not really doing a whole lot. And even if they are, um, like they're really just responsible for laying some things out, not really uh, responsible for managing state. Uh, and so what if we just kind of change the way we think about these components and really literally make them responsible for laying things out. And that's what uh, composition is. This is very similar to what you um, might know from like Vue or even AngularJS, we called this transclusion, uh, except you could only transclude one thing. Now you can do like multiple, uh, but yeah, so you've got slots. React has had this forever. Um, you basically make a prop that is uh, the React element that you want to um, render in a specific place. So the header is responsible for rendering the, the logo, but it's not. it doesn't have to be responsible for creating the element that goes into the logo position. 
It's just responsible for putting the logo in that spot. And so if we pass it a prop that says, here's the logo, I'll, I'll create the React element and give it to you. Then because we're responsible for creating the React element, we can pass the state directly to that element that we create. We don't have to worry about prop drilling. So here is our logo. We're gonna uh, pass down that state. And then our settings needs to be able to update that state. And so we'll pass that down whatever the case may be, whatever that state may be, but composing things um, slightly differently can make it so you don't have to prop drill nearly as much. And um, Michael Jackson actually has a great video uh, about this type of composition with better examples if you want to go take a look at that. And the React Docs has had this for a very long time, so you can go take a look at the React Docs as well. So if composition isn't quite doing it for you, or like maybe you're, we're talking about user authentication and literally everything just needs the user object, then that's a great situation for context. Most often context is useful for libraries, um, but yeah, there are definitely situations, I think probably every application uh, is gonna need to use context directly um, in some form. So uh, yeah, this is what context is. We have our counter and counter display, and let's say that we don't want to prop drill, um, it, like this is prop drilling at one layer, is that even drilling? It's not, but just for the sake of, of simplicity, we're gonna just say, hey, I don't want to drill in count and increment, I just wanna make those available to everybody who renders under me. So the way that this works is you make a uh, count provider and we're gonna, or sorry, this is gonna be a count context and here we're gonna say react create context. And then right here, we'll say count context provider. We'll provide a value and our value is going to be an object with the count and increment. And then we'll close that up with the count context provider. And we'll move this stuff in here and now we don't need to um, worry about passing the count because it's this component is going to get that from elsewhere. And same with the count and increment for the counter itself. So we're no longer drilling anymore. We, we don't need to pass those props. We can get those from elsewhere. And we can get this from elsewhere. And now to be able to get this, we need to say, hey, React, um, earlier, up higher in the tree, I told you to put a value into a little box for me. I need to grab the value from the box. Could you get that for me? And React says, yeah, sure, totally. And the way that we ask for that little box, that little value, is by saying React use context, and we pass the context object that we used, uh, or that we got from React create context. So that's how React associates our uh, use context call with uh, the provider value that we've been provided. So here now, I'm gonna get that value, which I'm going to simply destructure into the count and increment. Okay, so we're getting exactly this exact same object here. So then I can change on increment uh, click to just simply increment, and then here we've got our count, and then we can do the same thing for our count display right here. And now we've avoided prop drilling, um, for this one particular element of state. So we don't have to do that for all the state in our application. We'll talk about that next, but um, we are uh, able to avoid this prop drilling just using the tools that React gives us directly out of the React toolbox. And I think that is uh, really valuable. So, um, oh, and it works with the use reducer. So if that's your jam, that's great. Um, I do have a blog post about how to use React context effectively. This is not it. Um, it. It goes into a little bit more depth. So feel free to take a look at that blog post. So let's talk a little bit more about co-location. So you know how I talked about we lift state up and then we want to co-locate it down. So this also applies to context and providers. And in a typical application, you're going to have maybe several providers. You'll have a user, notifications, uh, theme, and authent uh, authentication. Here we have a router. So, um, you know, th the interesting thing about all of these providers and this pyramid of doom that people seem to always be really concerned about, which by the way, I'm not, I like, this is not confusing to me at all, but some people are really like concerned about this. Interesting thing about this is as soon as you make a context, uh, people seem to just be drawn to put it at the root of their application. And I don't blame them because it, it makes it really uh, straightforward. You can, once it's in the global, then you can just move stuff all over the place. You don't have to worry about where it is or, or anything for any consumers. Um, but the, 
you're kind of hurting yourself in doing that. Um, typically what will happen is your file structure will follow the structure of your React component tree. And if you put everything at the global, then your React component tree or, or your file structure might look something like this. Now this isn't a recommendation on how to structure files or anything. Please don't take that. This is just what a, a, a natural file structure might look like for something like this. So here we have our source, we have providers because these are all global. So we're just gonna put it in this providers thing. Then we've got all of our screens and everything. Uh, the problem with this sort of thing is that if I wanted to make a change to notifications, and, and let's just act under the assumption that notifications provider is only needed in the notifications um, components, all right? Or, or maybe the, um, the theme provider is only needed in the settings page or whatever the case may be. So if that, let, let's just go with the notifications. If that's the case, then by putting the notifications provider at the global rather than um, directly in here means that anytime I need to make changes to the notifications, I also have to deal with the global uh, context of the notifications, which means I'm working in, in multiple directories. I'm making changes to different files that um, may impact other files and, uh, and just adds to the level of complexity just because I decided to make the notifications global. In addition to that, I actually potentially could have a performance problem depending on the way that I structure things uh, because whenever the notifications re-renders, I may end up re-rendering more of the application than I really uh, intended. And on top of that, another performance consideration is the fact that anything that is in your global right here at the top of your app, that needs to be on the client before your app can be rendered. So that means that you have to load all of that code, you have to execute all of that code, and you have to render this before anybody gets a chance to uh, to see anything at all. And so this is unfortunate because it means you can't code split any of that logic or any of the, you know, the, um, like, yeah, you just can't code split it. And this is not a great thing if, uh, if it's not absolutely necessary to be global. And so what we can do instead is, sure, you can have your app and, and there may be some things that need to be global. Um, but maybe there are some things that don't need to be global, like the notifications or the user uh, for the user screen. So you just co-locate those to where they need to be. And then those things can be code split and it just naturally falls out that the provider would also be code split as well as all of the logic and whatever libraries you're using inside of there uh, can also be code split. And then the, the natural um, f uh, directory structure that falls out of that is you don't need to have that in the providers. You just put that directly along with the notifications. And then if I'm working on notifications, I'm just in this little area and I don't bother anybody else or any other uh, code that I'm maybe not as familiar with. I can just stick in there. So it can make things a lot simpler. Uh, now, again, this is not a recommendation of a file structure. Um, you can go read what Dan has to say about file structure there. Um, but yeah, a couple of the benefits here, code splitting just works, the file structure scales really well, and you have reduced interaction. You don't have to think about as much when, uh, when you just co-locate this stuff as much as you can. Now, I know that some of you are like, oh, I can't, but what about performance? And so I just won't need to address that. Yes, sometimes there are certain things that React just isn't gonna do for you. And um, this is uh, like for, um, you know, I intense graphics or you got a, um, a chart or something like that. Yeah, sometimes you're gonna be trying to do things that just aren't going to work uh, with the way that React's reconciliation works. And so for those situations, you need to step outside of React a little bit. And um, after you've followed my aforementioned advice, because you, you may be having performance problems just because of the way that you're structuring things and, and thinking about state. So after you've done all of those things, if you still have performance issues that you've measured and you know what those performance issues are, then take a look at Jotai or Recoil. They're very similar tools, but I like Jotai more. Um, really interesting uh, ideas of kind of stepping outside. Now I'll, I'll mention, I've never used Jotai in production. I've never used Recoil in production, but um, I've researched them enough to um, have confidence that they can help um, specific performance problems. So learn what problems they're intended to solve and then, uh, and then use them to solve uh, your problems if you're having those same problems. So let's just wrap up. 
interview, um, it's really important to remember server cache is not the same as UI state. If you use React query, then you can put all your server cache over here, and then um, and then your React state, what's left, is actually quite simple. And React query makes your server cache pretty simple too. So you end up with, um, you know, this really complicated problem has been simplified uh, significantly. And again, look forward to Remix. I think it's just the bomb. Uh, state uh, or React is a state management library. Uh, it has all of the tools that you really need for like 90% of the cases. And you're probably that you have a 90% likelihood that you are part of that 90%. So keep that in mind. Um, lift state up or down for co-location. Use composition when prop drilling is a pain. And sometimes you can use context. And if performance is an issue, look into Joe Tai. That's all that I have for you. Thank you so much. Definitely check out epicreact.dev and I'll see you around the internet. Bye.